Welcome to Chapter 11, and in Chapter 11 we're going to be concentrating on the Stockholders' Equity section of the balance sheet. And we're looking at it from the perspective of a corporation. We learned back in Chapter 1 that there were three primary types of business organizations, sole proprietorships, partnerships, and corporations. And part of the reasons corporations are so popular with um, investors and as a form of business ownership are, first of all, that they limit the legal liability of its owners. Remember with a corporation, stockholders are the owners of the corporation. And the most that a stockholder can lose is the amount of their investment. This is different with a sole proprietorship and a partnership. As sole proprietors and partners, from a legal standpoint, the business is the owner. And if the business owes money and can't pay it back, then creditors can petition the court to sell the personal assets and resources of the owners to satisfy or pay off the business's debts. It's not like that with a corporation. The maximum amount that the stockholder can lose would be whatever their original investment is. So stockholders have limited liability where sole proprietors and partners have unlimited liability. Another reason corporations are so popular is corporations are able to raise large amounts of money because investors can easily participate in a corporation's ownership. Because first of all, shares of stock can be purchased in small amounts. If we think about sole proprietorships and partnerships, usually the sole proprietor or partner has to come up with a significant amount of money in order to get the business started. But a stockholder, as an owner of a corporation, can buy just one share and become an owner. So the amount of investment could be much smaller than if it were a partnership or a sole proprietorship. Next, owner in, in, sorry, ownership interests are transferable. In other words, stockholders can sell their stock on an exchange. Let's think back about sole proprietorships and partnerships. Again, from a legal standpoint, when ownership is changed, the old sole proprietorship or partnership ceases to be and a new one begins. So if you're a partner in a partnership of three individuals and you decide you need some some more investment money and you want to take on a fourth partner, then the old partnership ends and the new partnership begins with the addition of that fourth person. Even if it's a different person but the same number of partners, the old business ends and the new business begins. With any change in ownership, a new business starts. Not so with a corporation. As an owner, a stockholder can sell their ownership in the corporation. They can sell their stock, and yet the corporation continues to exist as is. A corporation has perpetual life, which means it goes on and on and on. And this third item in C is actually a repeat of one. Stockholders are not liable personally for the corporation's debts. Creditors have no legal claim on the personal assets of the stockholders. That's a really nice way to explain what we see in item one here. So corporations account for about 90% of the total sales reported by U.S. businesses and now we know why it's such a popular form of business ownership. And as I mentioned earlier, a corporation is a separate legal entity. It may own assets. It can incur liabilities. It can expand and contract in size. It can sue others and be sued. It can enter under um, into contracts and it pays taxes. To protect everyone's rights, the creation and oversight of a corporation are tightly regulated by law. Now the way corporations are started is that um, a company has to apply to a state government because the governance of corporations belong to the state. Each state has its own rules about how a corporation is created and what it's allowed to do. If the application to create a corporation is approved, 
then the state issues a charter, which is sometimes called the Articles of Incorporation. And those spell out um, the name of the corporation, its address, the nature of its business, who the ownership, um, you know, what the ownership structure is, who the incorporators are, the people who began the corporation. Now it states here that the ownership structure can vary from one company to the next, but in its basic form, a corporation must have at least one type of stock. And if there's only one, we call it common stock. And these are the common benefits or the, the most frequent benefits of common stock. First of all, common stockholders have a right to vote on corporate matters. It might be um, the election of um, stockholders to serve on the board of directors who then set policy for the corporation. Or it might be a decision to, as to whether the company should issue stock or bonds to raise money to grow the company. But they have a right to vote. Secondly, stockholders, common stockholders, have a right to receive dividends if they are declared by the board of directors. Declare, the declaration of a dividend belongs to the board of directors and that board is elected by the stockholders. Stockholders do not have a right to dividends until they are declared and you can't force the board of directors to give you a dividend as a stockholder. Thirdly, common stockholders have a residual claim. That means that if the company ceases operations, the stockholders share in any assets remaining after the creditors have been paid. And then finally, the preemptive right. The preemptive right means that common stockholders have the right to retain their same ownership percentage if new shares are going to be sold and issued. So if you currently own 10% of the company's shares and the company is going to be issuing new shares of stock, then you have a right to buy 10% of the new shares. You don't have to, but if you want to maintain your ownership percentage, you have a right to do so. Okay, now let's talk about equity versus debt financing. And if you remember from Chapter 10, debt financing would be raising money by taking on some type of, of debt, perhaps a bond, um, or it could be a long-term liability. And equity financing means selling stock to raise money. So let's talk about the advantages of each. With equity financing or selling stock, you don't have to give the stockholders back their original investment. Yet, if you have a bond or another type of long-term liability, you have to pay that debt. It must be repaid. If the company does not have enough cash or just does not want to issue dividends, it doesn't have to. It's not required until the Board of Directors declares a dividend. Yet interest must be paid if you had a bond or other type of long-term liability. There's, there's no choice on that. Now what about debt financing? While yes, you do have to pay interest, it is tax deductible so it can lower your taxable income. Dividends are not tax deductible. They are a share of the net income of the company that we give to the owners, the stockholders. Debt, while having to be repaid, does not change stockholder control. What we're talking about here is when you issue new stock, that means you're adding more owners. There's more folks to share in the earnings, more folks to vote. It dilutes stockholders' control. I just wanted to call your attention at the very bottom to this statement here because it is an important one. All transactions between a company and its stockholders affect the balance sheet accounts only. We won't be dealing with any income accounts here. You cannot make money on the sale of your own stock. You can increase investment, but you can't make a profit or incur a loss in dealing with your own stock. Okay, so now we're going to be getting in, into more vocabulary here. Let's take a quick look at page 511 here in the textbook. 
This is a slightly more complicated version of the stockholders' equity section of the balance sheet. If you remember from Chapter 1, in the stockholders' equity section of the balance sheet, we only had two accounts. We had common stock and retained earnings. Now it's going to get a little bit more complicated with this chapter. We'll have a section called contributed capital, and contributed capital are amounts that the investors or stockholders have contributed to the company. We will be talking in a few moments about preferred stock, but we have common stock as well. So the stock accounts would be the amounts the stockholders have contributed. And then we have the earned capital or retained earnings, and that's the accumulated net income less net income that you gave away called dividends of the company. And so there are our definitions here. Contributed capital, the amount of capital the company received from investors' contributions in exchange for the company's common stock or preferred stock. Retained earnings, reports the cumulative amount of net income earned by the company less the cumulative amount of dividends since the corporation was organized. Remember, we subtract the dividends because it's taking the net income and sharing it with the investors, the stockholders. I'm sorry, I didn't realize we scrolled in there and you couldn't see what we were talking about there. Okay, now let's talk about treasury stock. Treasury stock reports shares of stock that were previously issued to and owned by stockholders but have been reacquired and are now held by the corporation. So the corporation actually buys back its own stock. And taking a look at page 511 here, here's treasury stock at the bottom. Treasury stock is a contra stockholders equity account. It's shown as a subtraction. The reason is this amount is already included in the stock accounts here. When treasury stock is bought back, it's a temporary thing. We don't intend on retiring that stock and never selling it again. In fact, our intentions are to buy it back for a particular purpose and then reissue it. So the amounts that were bought back, we leave here in these accounts. And when we buy the treasury stock, we subtract it here. Eventually, that treasury stock will be sold again. And the last item here, and you don't have to really worry about this one, it's accumulated other comprehensive income or loss. And this deals with unrealized or uncollected gains and losses on certain assets. For example, pensions, foreign currencies, financial investments. Sometimes we call them holding gains. These are investments the company has and they've appreciated or depreciated in value and we show that change in value here. We won't be talking any more about that one. Okay, now let's talk about some categories of stock here. First of all, authorized shares. Authorized shares are the number of shares the corporation's charter indicates as the maximum number that the corporation is allowed to issue or sell. So it's the number that the company is allowed, sorry, to issue or sell. There we go, we've got it all on there. Issued shares are shares that will be owned forever by one stockholder or another. In other words, they've been distributed to stockholders. Treasury shares are shares that have been repurchased by the corporation. And here's a really important one, outstanding shares. These are shares owned by the stockholders not by the corporation. In other words, these are uh, shares that are currently in the hands of the stockholders. And the reason why outstanding shares are important is only outstanding shares can vote and only outstanding shares receive dividends. So to review again, authorized shares are the number of shares that the corporation's charter allows them to sell over the lifetime of the company. 
issued shares are shares that were distributed to the stockholders. Treasury shares have been bought back. So outstanding shares would be the shares that were issued minus the shares that were bought back. The outstanding shares are the shares that will receive dividends and can vote in corporate issues. Now let's try a quick problem here. We're going to be doing in our worksheet the very first problem, M311-3. The balance sheet for Crutcher Corporation reported 200,000 shares outstanding, 300,000 shares authorized, and 20,000 shares in Treasury stock. And they want us to compute the maximum number of new shares that Crusher could issue. Okay. What I suggest is to kind of think about all of these terms in, in terms of a tree. Okay. First of all, we have the authorized shares. Those are all the shares that the company is allowed to sell over its lifetime. And we're told that number is 300,000. Now, from the authorized shares, you have two groups. You have those shares that were issued or distributed to stockholders, and then you have shares that were not yet issued, not yet sold to stockholders. Of the issued shares, some are still in the hands of the stockholders. We call those outstanding shares, and some of those issued shares were bought back. We call those treasury shares. Now let's kind of fill this in. We have 200,000 shares outstanding, so we'll put that number there. 300,000 shares authorized, that goes there. 20,000 shares in treasury stock. Okay. So 200,000 shares are currently in the hands of the stockholders and 20,000 have been bought back. So in all, that means that 220,000 shares had been distributed to stockholders. Well, if you're allowed to issue 300,000 and you have already issued 220,000, that leaves only 80,000 still not issued. So that's the maximum number of new shares that Crusher could issue, 80,000. So we're going to end there, and our next topic is going to be a continuation of um, learning outcome 11-2. We're learning about journal entries to issue stock.